Hello everyone. Today we have another new guest. Uh, he is Mr. Donalds and he is from Silicon Valley and he has many interesting idea, research and intellectual activities uh, with networking, innovation, economical development. So he will share the idea, thoughts that how an entrepreneur can go uh, with all of his experience from Stanford University and Silicon Valley. So hello, uh, Mr. Donald, how are you? I am fabulous. Nice to okay. see you all. Thank you. I can't uh, but still. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, can you please introduce yourself, uh, who you are, where you're from, what you do, and uh, like, uh, like how you, how, what you want to share with us? I started out my, actually my undergraduate degree was in linguistics, but then I switched to software engineering and did that for about. 20 some years, and then I got interested in business. And I started to under, I started to ask the question, why is a business successful in Silicon Valley? And you start the exact same business and it wouldn't be successful in Finland where I was uh, helping businesses in Finland. And that led me to understanding the idea of what's called social net networks. And that term was around um, can you see my screen? Yeah, uh, no, it's still no. Okay, let me try this. Okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, try this. Well, yes. Can you, you can't see it, right? Yes, sir. You can see it. Okay, good. Well, let me just do this. So can you see this relationship success? For, for yes, sir. I, I can see these things, but if you just uh, uh, like uh, made a full size, yes, full size, it will be great because uh, hopefully our audience can understand more uh, what you want to share because. Uh, uh, yes, perfect. Okay. Now you can see it. OK, well, I'll get back and you can see my face again later, but. Um, what I want to talk about is basically to get you to think about something different than you usually think. When we think of business and we think of uh, organizations, why is Silicon Valley so successful? Why are some organizations so successful? Why are some people so successful? And you hear a lot of answers about creativity and how creativity works and, and it puts it all on the individual. But what I'm going to teach you is that we're part of a community and that it's important. And I'm going to teach you how that works. OK, so first off, before anything else, I want you to think for a minute. Usually I do this and people discuss it, but we can't very well do that this time. But I want you to just spend 30 seconds or 15 seconds short time and answer this question. Think of three things you get that are valuable and important in life that you don't get from other people. Mm -hmm. Usually in a room full of 30 people, people come up with things like meditating, walk on a beach or something like that. But money, mm -hmm. fame, um, love, uh, everything that you use in your life, the food you eat, even the water you drink is, is processed by organizations that do that. Literally everything that you get that's valuable in life, you get from other people. So we live in this world of other people, and yet we spend a lot of time doing things just about ourselves. And I want to show you that that actually innovation and the success of Silicon Valley 
has a lot to do with the networks. And I want to just take a minute and talk about the difference between a different definition of social networks than you're used to. And the term social networks has been being used since 1845. So here is the first use of social networks here. Uh, I won't read things to you because if you can see them, you can read them yourself. And uh, I'll give you a few seconds to read things, but I'll just talk about the slides and not um, read them. So anyway, so this is from a, an autobiography. Social networks and social network analysis, looking at social networks and analyzing them has been happening since we have here 1957 was the first book about. It. And by social network, I'm talking about the networks of relationships you have with other people. So you may have gone to school with some people and you're still in contact with those people. Your family is a social network. Your friends are a social network. There are people that are connected together for some reason, like doing business together, friendship, playing a sports team together, going to a religious organization together. There's all of these reasons. And then any, any given group of people may be know, all know each other, but they might know no one in the other group. Like it may be possible that your family doesn't know anybody that you went to school with, but you're the connection between the two. You're the link. I wanted to just show you this one. This is the conference of International Network of Social Network Analysts. And this is from 1980, uh, sorry, 19, 2018, as you can see here. But if you subtract this, uh, 37 or 38 from 2018, that's 30 years. So that means that the International Network of Social Network Analysts was having a conference in 1980. So it's a different meaning than the websites like Facebook and things like that, that they stole the name. I even know who did it. So anyway, I'm going to show you some pictures of networks and talk about this just a little bit because there's one concept I'd like you to be aware of. And then I can apply the concept to what I'm talking about. This is an example of representation of social networks where and what this is represents is groups of people that are connected to each other in some way so one of them could be your family the other one could be who you went to school with the other and there's somebody oops and when you get into any of these groups and you want information or you want uh, some sort of usually information, you might want a job, you might want to, you might need uh, information about being an accountant if you're an engineer. A lot of times you, you don't know what, how to do various kinds of things and you need resources to do it. And remember, everything that you get, you're going to get from some other person. <laughs> So the connections that you have to other people are critical. In this particular case, I have it set up so that you can see that this person up here, they're, they're stuck. They can't get out of the, of the connections that they have. So they're limited in the information that they can get. Now, this is where it starts getting super interesting. Imagine there's some person, and it could be you, that's connecting all of the, is in both groups. So there's one group is your family, one group is your um, people you went to college with. If you're, you're in business or an organization, it could be a, a group that's doing two different projects. 
Um, it could be the accounting department or the marketing department and the engineering department. People who are can do both engineering and marketing turn out to be really, really valuable because they know what the each group is thinking and they can pass the information from one group to another and they're they're in the middle so they become totally necessary and what happens is am i new what happens now is that if somebody wants information they have to go through this person to get it and so this person becomes a bridge between these two different, um, you know, just so, somebody doesn't have their mute on and I'm hearing a lot of background noise. Oh, well, um, there, that's wonderful. Thank you. So the person now can can reach all the people in this group and can reach this person that's very remote over there and, and this doesn't just apply to um individuals these can be organizations and the links between them can be businesses that they do together they can be countries and the links between them are Valuable, res valuable resources. For instance, as I said, I do some work in Finland. Finland is a very teeny country. It's like 5 million people. And when I teach at the university there, there are students from everywhere. I have Chinese students, Spanish students, and various students from everywhere, because Finland has made a conscious decision as a country to try and build relationships with other countries. And the reason for this, or a reason for this, is Finland is very committed to innovation. They actually teach innovation at their universities and they're very committed to it. And it turns out that innovation isn't something that just pops into the head of somebody. A person doesn't just like channel, I don't know, some magical force that has this innovation pop into their heads. Because if you look at people and you look at what really goes on, um, Edison, Thomas Edison stole things from everybody he could. He, the, somebody else invented the light bulb and they were sailing across the ocean to defend their patent on the light bulb. This is a true story and there was a storm and the ship sank. So the person that was trying to, that actually invented the light bulb didn't get credit for it because they died in a, in a sailing accident. Or, uh, even Einstein was in the middle, was at Princeton, and there's a set of mathematical um, rules called the Lorenz transformations that from the Lorenz transformations, you can actually um, do a, some integration and you'll get E equals MC squared. So he, he, did, he did math on something that was existing that he got from somebody else. So a lot of studies have showed that people don't just magically think things up. What they do is they borrow stuff from one social world and then take it into another social. And I want to define social world just a little bit, which is that within the networks that we have, and a term for these is cluster. So within any individual cluster, we all talk to each other and we all know the same things. But um, in if you want new information, you have to go to a different cluster. And so people borrow things from one cluster and they bring it into another cluster. More than just having the same information, they wind up a lot of times having the same point of view. So within one cluster, maybe people like one politician and within another cluster, they like another politician or 
They like the same kind of music. There's all these different reasons where people within a cluster start gravitating towards the same views and the same uh, world, the same view of the world. And the reason it's important to know that is because when you're bridging, when you become this yellow dot, you're going to need to be open-minded enough to be able to be okay with people having different views of the world. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit later too. There's research that's done, been done where a person, David Oxfeld, went to a Ford manufacturing plant and he identified the areas where there was the most innovation. And every single time, the person that was the innovator would had crossed over into two different groups, so or more different groups. And that's something that we see over and over and over again. So, there we go. So, what this is is if you want to get to this person, the the one on the extreme, my left. It, the pink dot over there, you don't really have a connection because this um, cluster over here wasn't attached. So if you know one person in that cluster, you have a connection, but the connection to this person, to the pink dot is very weak because you have to go through somebody else. But if you go out and you make connections, sometimes in a random way, you can change the situation so that now you have multiple paths and your, your link becomes much stronger. Now, what I want to say is that this orange thing is not necessarily the same business or the same whatever that, that, you, that the rest of them, are, the same type of connection. So for instance, I know the director of software for Oracle and I know him because I have a hobby of playing music. And so we went to a music camp together and I met him there at the music camp. And so now I can just write him anytime. And that's an example. So the orange could be the church that you go to. It could be um, um, music camp, like I was just talking about. It could be anything. And then you wind up, uh, going wind up having a stronger connection to these other people so that you can get through and do that so on an organizational level that can be things that people do sometimes companies have softball games where they play each other or especially within a company their marketing department will play a softball game against the engineering department and that's a, a way that's the orange way of connecting people together not necessarily exactly the force of business. And there's a very important point to what I'm saying right now. The point is that if you focus too much on one type of person, you're going to wind up limiting, limiting yourself because the type of person that you're going to want to connect with are, is going to be the same kind of person as is in your cluster. So to expand your cluster, you have to be open to meeting and connecting to anyone. Once I was putting together a, a panel discussion, one of the people on the panel discussion was Suhas Patil. And he's one of the most respected serial entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. He started Cirrus Logic, which is the first fabulous semiconductor. So he's like hot shit, but pardon my friend. And, um, and he once said, and he said to the audience, he said, if you have an idea, tell this idea to everyone you meet, every single solitary person. Don't try and keep it a secret because you're, because no matter what good idea you have, somebody else has, it, and probably a lot of them. So 
don't kid yourself and think, oh, I have this great intellectual property and I'm going to hide it from everybody else. Don't, he recommends not to do that. And I recommend not to do that too, because the better you tell your story, uh, you just, the more likely it is that people can spread it around and you can get the resources you need, financial resources, marketing resources, lots of different kinds of resources you need to have a company. So Suhas Patil said, tell it to everyone you can. You never know who's going to be able to help you. You might need them in a laundry mat. It's not something that we intuitively think. Okay. Now you have a good connection. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. I just want to briefly tell you a story about how social network analysis works. And this is the very first person who did social network analysis was a psychologist or at least the kind we're talking about was a psychologist named James Moreno. And he didn't call them social networks. He called it, we usually call the drawing social networks as well as the networks that they represent. He called this a sociogram. And what he did is he asked children in school, who would you like to sit next to? And he did it every year for many, for various kinds of years. And in this, the, the triangles are girls and the circles are boys. And you can see in first grade, girls and boys would sit next to each other and it was absolutely no, it was just random who they'd sit next to. And then by the time you got to second grade, notice that there was this one kid who was, everybody wanted to sit next to the popular one. And the popular one connected was connected to the, between the girls and the boys, but most people didn't. And by the time you get to third grade, the bo boys and the girls don't want to sit to get each other with each other mostly at all. There's just a couple of them. And by the time you get to fourth grade, there's only one kid that wants to sit next to a girl or a boy, and the rest only want to sit next to people in their same sex. And that happens again in fifth grade. They're completely separate by sixth grade. And then in seventh grade, they start to want to sit next to each other again. Why, why do you think that is? That's uh, pretty obvious there. They're starting to grow up and boys and girls start to like each other in a different way. And so by the time they're in eighth grade, they're starting to want to sit next to each other again. And the point of this reason I'm pointing out this drawing is because we actually go into organizations and figure out these kinds of relationships because what we're seeing, what we see sometimes is this. And this is a true story of a person that went into an organization, it was a lumber mill and it wasn't working out very well. The, they had a lot of issues. And if you look at it, what you're seeing here is that there's this one guy, Norm, who connects between these two groups inside of the sawmill, but otherwise no one else. So that means each of these groups had a view of the company, what the company did, what was valuable for the company, and, and other issues like that that were common inside their group, but different than they were in the other group. So the way that they solved this is they started having events and having ways that the people from one side were got together with the people on the other side. And after just a few months, every problem in that company just went away. So no, these connections are incredibly important and powerful. So now I'm going to spend a little bit talking about 
how this works for you as an individual. And this is a picture of Silicon Valley, so I'm going to talk about Silicon Valley. No matter what you do, it's going to be common for you to fail. I'm back. Hi. Yes, uh, thank you. This is this is very interesting discussion because everyone around the world, we always say that network, network, network. Network is very important. Even example, I'm from Asia, from my schools, my university, my corporate life, always people say network. But you come up with a scientific discussion, how actually scientifically it's helpful, economically it's helpful. And I, I, I believe that uh, there is a huge corporations, university, maybe they can learn from your a scientific approach how to grow network and how it become more successful and it create valuable things in for our life for our profession and everything beside that i want to know uh, i think our audience also want to know already i find that different universities and even different nations they are start to sharing this session so uh, like how actually silicon valley even even stanford university they grow their tech industry like uh, as you are from inside and what 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 the uh, like initiative they took to make it more successful it's a wonderful story and a very good question because it sort of proves the point of what i'm talking about uh stanford was kind of a small college my my grandfather went to stanford in 1915 and mm -hmm. so my dad went to stanford and i got to go there for a while but um, Fred Terman took over as uh, provost of Stanford. And he got this idea where he gave any businessman that wanted to take courses at Stanford, he would let them take courses at 10 cents on the dollar. In other words, he gave them a huge discount so that they go there. And he deliberately merged Stanford together with the business community. And he did it on purpose because his his mentor, his teacher at MIT um, was the first, he sometimes considered to be the father of the internet, really, really understood about how important these connections were. It's, his name was ben, Vandermeer Bush, and he was at, he was at MIT. And uh, Terman was originally from the Bay Area and then he moved back and went to MIT and then he came back and he was provost of Stanford. And so Stanford did just what I'm talking about. They took these two individual groups. At Stanford, it could be quite a lot of things. They have engineers and they have great scientists and a lot of people there, but they merged it with the business community so that they have, they made all these connections. So when people wanted to start companies from Stanford, they already knew they already knew the people that were going to be able to help them. Because if you're an engineer and you want to start a company, I guarantee you, you don't know what you need to know. I guarantee it. Because I've seen it over and over and over again that because I work with an incubator and the engineers just don't get the money part of it. They're there's, it's too kind of fuzzy, but again, that's what I'm saying. And I actually gave these talks in Finland and the Finnish to some of the government people there. And they started doing that on purpose, trying to connect their companies more to other companies. And, and Finland had a huge glow because Nokia just basically went south and it was like 20% of their economy or something like that. So, but they, what they did is they took the engineers that had been at Nokia and then they helped them start companies. So they started a whole bunch of new, little new companies and some of those have gotten to be successful. And so Finland's doing okay, which is very cool. And it's kind of, kind of I learned about this first from a 
guy at Stanford named Mark Ranavetter, who's a friend of mine now. And Mark Ranavetter has a paper that, well, his he has basically three main papers, but if you add up the academic citations on the three three papers, it's over 120,000. 120,000 people have cited his papers, which is a lot more than, it's even more than Einstein. And, um, and his original paper that got so much notice was called, was called The Strength of Weak Ties. And it was about getting jobs. And he did research in the Northeast where he interviewed a lot, a lot of people, uh, professionals. And he found out that was almost by random that they got their jobs. They would be going to a party where they would see a friend that they hadn't seen in years. And that friend would say, oh, we need somebody else at our company. It wasn't sending resumes. Almost no one gets jobs by sending resumes. The vast majority of people got um, their jobs through doing exactly what I just said. They go to a different group. Because if they're in one cluster, everyone in that cluster knows the same thing. So they know all the jobs. You're not going to find anything new. But if you go to the other cluster, it's a, they have completely different information so that you'll be able to find out, find a job more easily from that. So that was, that paper, I think, has over 70,000 citations been used in business and sociology and everywhere. Very cool. So, so uh, yeah, the, I, I just want to add, add another question. Beside uh, the Silicon Valley, like like how they grow their business and other things, like as you have a huge international exposure, huge international relationship. So, can you relate any of the specific place from Asia or Africa or Europe? Those who are also doing very good. Absolutely, that was where I was. Go I'm going with this. Stan. <laughs> Mark had at Stanford the Silicon Valley Network Analysis Project. And since I was doing research in the area, he, he had me be a visiting scholar at Stanford and I started working with his group. And we looked at the networks in Silicon Valley and there are, as you said, huge international exposure. And it's a lot the way I said, said it's weak ties. Somebody moves to Silicon Valley, usually when you first get there, maybe your, your language is not as perfect in English, you go to communities that are similar to you at first. And so inside of Silicon Valley, and there's a Malaysian community, I'm sure there's Chinese communities, there's every kind of community. Then what happens is if you need to expand your business into that area, it's so easy to find somebody that knows somebody that can help you do it. At our incubator, we have a Chinese guy that Chinese that helps us sometimes raise money from China. And again, it was sort of random. He came to one of our events. We made friends with him. And 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 so it's what I was saying. Everything you get is from other people. So we built this incredible amount of resources over the years. I mean, that's not all there is. I mean, venture capital was basically invented in Silicon Valley. And, uh, half, I think about half the venture capitalists in the United States are in Silicon Valley. And if you want a lawyer that knows how to start a company, there's like law firm after law firm in you know, 10 story buildings on Page Mill Road. So, and then of course we have Stanford and Berkeley, which are two of the best colleges in the world. And, and so we have kind of an unfair advantage, but th the fact of the relationships and then off and then we're lucky because people bring ideas from everywhere. We don't know what the problems are. I don't know what the problems are in Malaysia right now. What could I make that would be the most wonderful thing that Malaysians would just buy like crazy and be so happy about? I'm sure there's plenty of Malaysians that know that. I don't though. So if a Malaysian comes to Silicon Valley, we can take their ideas and help make them real, <laughs> which is very cool. And the truth is we found that that, that actually happens. And that's, that's 
what our strength. And so I want to say one other thing, and I'll, from then on, maybe we can just do Q&A. But uh, the other thing that I want to say is about you personally, as a person, for every person, we do exactly what I said. Our rewards, our most happiness comes from our closest friends. And we want to talk to them in a way that they agree with us. We say things to them, make them feel good. They say things to us that make us feel good, but they may not be right. We may, we may be telling each other things that we heard and we didn't really check on. And so we're not really talking. And it's harder to want to go to a place where people see the world differently and and maybe the things that you believe you have to some of them you have to just say well okay maybe i was wrong or or maybe i'm still right but i'm not going to disagree with the person on this it's not worth it we're gonna i'm just gonna understand that different people have different views and so creating networks yourself personally creating them within an organization creating them between organizations and and doing it between countries requires effort. You have to go to, if you're an engineer, you have to go to a marketing meetup. You have to go and actually meet people that are into marketing. You have to sit down and talk to them, have a drink together, whatever, a meal together, whatever happens to work so that you can um, get to know them better and, and make them connections. It's something that you have to do. And I want, to go, where I'm going with that is one of the most critical keys about Silicon Valley is every country, Malaysia, Finland, I've been, uh, I've also talked to the Austrian, all of them want Google, Facebook, and Apple, and these kinds of companies that are so big that they're bigger than the economy of a lot of these countries. Uh, but that's an illusion because Silicon Valley starts so many companies that for every company you've ever heard of, there are at least a thousand companies that fail. At least a thousand. People start companies, they last for six months, they last a year. Some of them don't get funding, some of them do. 80% of the ones that get funding fail. 80%. So in Silicon Valley, we have a kind of a ethic or a rule or a intuitive idea that it's okay to fail. People can start a company, go bankrupt, start another company, go bankrupt, and then still get funding for a third company. People don't ostracize them because they learn, people learn from their mistakes. And somebody, if somebody keeps going, that means when times get tough, we know that person is going to keep going. They're a good person to be running a company because they're they're going to stick to it. A lot of places I've been in the world, like Finland and Austria or various places, it's not a good idea to fail. If you fail and you go bankrupt once, that's it. Nobody will ever, ever work with you again. And so that's we sort of succeed by failing. And that it's not an obvious thing. And I want to relate that to you personally, because any person, if you try to do this thing where you get new networks, or you try to do these things to build, to, to start a company or make better, better contacts within your own company or any of the things that I've been talking about, you'll probably run into situations where it just doesn't seem to be working. And you you can easily feel bad about yourself because of that, think that you've done something wrong, but there's no possible way that you can be doing something and learning something unless mistakes happen. Because if you already know how to do something, you don't make any mistakes, but you're not doing anything new. So I just want to encourage everyone to feel free to make 
feel free to make mistakes and try and learn to connect to people that are different than you. And uh, that's how you, and as I said, that's how you get jobs. That's how you get innovation. The thing that I was just saying about somebody coming from Singapore and starting a company, that's innovation. They're bringing an idea from someplace else into Silicon Valley, and that allows us to do it. And we have people from everywhere. So that's, that's why we're successful. Uh, so one of the interesting things I already learned from you that Silicon Valley, uh, like people fail, but they continue to do another jobs. They support their ecosystem support. Even in, in my personal life, I saw many of my friends that they are struggling with that. Like they're also in same things. Like if one time they fail, so everything gone. So, so. This is very important and very valuable culture Silicon Valley has. So how we can, like you, as you are more experienced from Silicon Valley, from Stanford, and that uh, you have all of the knowledge and the cultures, how we can uh, introduce this kind of cultures uh, to the other country, to the other government, to the other corporations, or other ecosystem that failure is not ultimately the problem problem is that we have to motivate the person we have to support this person and i know that many business organization in covid 19 situation uh, they go bankrupt or they lose their business or they sell their business what do you think how we can explore this beautiful culture to around the world that's a very Interesting question. I know that in in some countries like Finland, I know something about that because I got to know some of the government officials, and they actively have. Uh, it's a little harder with COVID nineteen, but they actively have, have meetups. I mean, this right here, what we're doing helps because if you look at a scientific reason why what I'm saying is true like I just showed you, the people that are listening to this get the idea that maybe, and so we have, you have to have groups, you have to teach people. I mean, once people understand, they're gonna act differently. The other thing that's really true in Silicon Valley is uh, if you go to a meetup, you guys have meetups in Singapore? I mean, in yes. Malaysia? Yes, yeah. Malaysia. So you go to a meetup and you meet somebody and the first thing you ask practically after you've asked their name and blah, 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 usually they have a name badge so you don't even have to ask is, how can I help you? What can I do to help you become more successful? So every person, th there's a wonderful book called Give and Take by, um, let's see, what's his name? Uh, Adam Ripken. And in it, he studied He's a Wharton School of Business professor, and he divided people into three classes, givers, exchangers, and takers. And givers are people who are just gen generous. They said, just like I'm talking about in Silicon Valley, how can I help you? They don't say, how can I make money off of you? Or I'll help you if you, um, if you do this for me. They just say, how can I help you? And they're not asking for anything in return. They're just doing that. And that's a giver. And then an exchanger would be saying, well, you know, I will help you, but you, you know, only if you do something in exchange for me. And then there's other people who just run around trying to get people to do things for them and uh, give them things and, and never have any intention of returning it. Those are takers. Well, he studied organizations and he found out that the number of CEOs that were givers was far higher than the percentage in the population at large, which is not what you'd think. You'd think that CEOs would be these cutthroat people who all they wanted to do is get money and blah, blah, blah. But that's not the case. They're the kind of people who make friends with people, who talk to people, who bridge these networks. Those are the people who become successful. And so just, it, it's, it's not intuitive. So I think doing what you're doing and exposing people to these ideas is a, a very important part of, of what, how to do it. That's, 
all I can say. And then each person themselves has to look inside themselves and say, how am I as a person? Am I a person that, that afraid and fearful and unwilling to make mistakes, unwilling to learn things? Um, I want to, I'm secret. I don't want people to know my ideas because they're so great. People will steal them and stuff like that. Um, having your ideas stolen isn't going to be a problem. Yeah. Have, convincing people that your idea is good enough to um, actually invest in and do something with, that's a problem. That's very, very, very difficult. And even if somebody steals the idea, they're back, they're in the same position as you. They've got to convince people it's a good enough idea so that people will join up with them and help them make it real. Mm -hmm. So do you think it'd be interesting to ask you the same question? How do you think it would be possible to, to help change cultures? Uh, yes, uh, this, is, this, is, this is actually a very interesting question because uh, what I believe that everything is mindset. Like uh, I, I find that, like example, people like you, uh, even this is not the first session. I think I do discuss with many, I think one, two years before. Many times I ask you different kind of help and you guide me. So so it's, it's all about my, uh, mindset. Even uh, maybe I ask hundred of people, maybe 10 or 20 people like you is a positive. So like i i believe that it's all about you you grow in a different culture you grow in a different community you know the, the benefit of helping the people benefit of networking benefit of um, communicating with the peoples maybe many of the people still they do not learn these things from their cultures so they have different mindset you have different mindset so why silicon valley producing more successful organization because of this mindset and uh, many of the company from developing nations, they cannot uh, successful and they're struggling because of this mindset. So I, I believe that uh, like people has uh, uh, say, ha has different, different culture. That's what I'm sure. But issue is that how people grow and develop their mindset. And uh, this is the ultimately the way of uh, exploring uh, uh, the things and way of talking, way of discussing, way of networking and way of success. So uh, I believe uh, it's all about actually mindset. Like if I have a positive mindset, even if I'm from Asia, whatever I am, uh, definitely I get some good community. And that is my objective as well. The World Talent Economy Forum, I, I do not want to make it in between Malaysia. I want to make it more global. Even not only from Silicon Valley, I want to learn from Europe. I want to learn from Canada. I want to learn from Africa, even Asia Pacific, even South Asia, even Middle East. So that, that's the reason that for uh, for this mindset, I, I, I try to build up uh, with my team to, OK, let's move in with, with, with the global community and build up something, uh, uh, those who are positive, those who have their positive mindset and those who can change the world, let's work together. So that is the answer I have. That's exactly what I'd recommend, really, because remember I talked about the different clusters and the advantage to not staying in your own cluster. But you could think of a cluster as a culture. And what it, what it is in the culture is like what you do, like say, for instance, a failure in your culture is very, very bad then you're going to be very, very, very careful and you're not going to do anything that's basically innovative because innovation is a good way to set yourself up for something that doesn't work because you can't. So if you're just so careful that you don't do anything unless you're 100% sure it's going to work, you're not going to be like Silicon Valley. That's, that's not the way innovation works. But So if you get outside of your cluster, and you start being in other people's cluster, you realize you can have, you can go from culture to culture. You can be in a different culture. And there's strong evidence of that because many, many people have come from different countries, Asia, especially there's a lot of people from India and China and Silicon Valley. And they, li they live there. They may go to Stanford and get an MBA 
they work at one of these companies and then they go back to their country, but they have that mindset. And that's been helping enormously in especially India for uh, development of their technology industry. If you look at it, many, many of the people who were the leaders there actually went to Silicon Valley and learned the Silicon Valley mindset. So you're gonna, if you do what I said and what you're doing now by getting people from all, all kinds of different places, it opens up people to realize that, you know, their culture isn't the only way. Yes, uh, sir, uh, in that present situation, like every country has economic challenges, every country and uh, many country even economically collapse, uh, even uh, many corporations, many industry, they have a lot of challenges, but what the ultimately solution we have as well as how technology actually uh, played to overcome from this uh, challenging situation? It's, there's different levels of it. From a global perspective, like in Silicon Valley, um, if it, that may be just the best. That company isn't doing what they, what they need to do. Why would we want them to stay around using money? In Silicon Valley, since failure is okay, it's, uh, if somebody is at a company that fails, well, their expertise is still their expertise. We kind of think of Silicon Valley as one big company with lots of different departments in it. And if one of them, you don't need one of them anymore, the people just go to a different one because there's people are needed. And so that's the thing I'm saying about failure being okay. And so on a personal level, you become more valuable when you learn things and make mistakes. And on a, um, more global level like Silicon Valley, often people sell the intellectual property and people actually, when a company fails, people don't necessarily lose money or even have a bad, uh, bad future experience. It's, it's set up so that that's just okay. Okay, so uh, like we saw that in USA and China, they have some sort of tension and challenges. What the opinion you want to give in this challenging situation? What will ultimately the future? Well, my opinion is, is that we've got a lunatic in the White House and he's just running around the world, screwing everything he can up. I am very, very big about keeping our trade with China. If China's stealing our intellectual property and it's a problem, we need to work through the World Trade Organization. We need to find different civilized ways of working with China so that we don't have that problem as much anymore. Uh, we need to keep countries that trade together don't fight. There's a huge amount of economists. The magazine had a, an article on that few years ago where they just showed that the percentage of company countries that actually did trade with each other that that had wars with each other was minuscule it almost never it does happen sometimes but very very rarely and so i would i would much prefer um us you know doing the things we do well and them doing the things they do well and when you add the two together it one and one equals three not one not two um, it's, uh, you make more. Yes. That's yes. Uh, sir, there are many young community in Asia, Asia and Asia Pacific, I think around 50, 57% youth community, those who are under 30 years old. What type of advice you want to give them right now? Because many people become unemployed and they have many challenges. What should they do right now in this challenging situation? I am not as much of an expert as that, um, though I did work a little bit trying to see help with the unemployment situation in Lebanon because, but it was mostly just conceptual. But I would recommend trying to be an entrepreneur. I really would like try.
try and start your own thing. Because once you do, then you get recognized and then people say, okay, this person knows something. I mean, it's the best resume you can have. It's a fabulous resume. And everywhere people need things. There's always, there's always something you can do to make people happier, healthier, um, more effective in their life. You know, all the different types. There's so many different things that people need. It's a matter of opening yourself and I just ask a question from what I said, what would be the most important thing you could do if you wanted to do that? The most important thing you could do would be get outside of your clusters and start looking in other places because your cluster, your place in the world, you know things that this does not over here. And if you go over here and you see, oh, we have something over here that they want over here, bingo, you've got a business. That's how it works. And so I would, it seems extremely difficult and it, it's very tough situation with all the unemployment in, in Asia, but you can't just send resumes and hope to get a job. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, there are some other things like example, sometimes few expert, even entrepreneur, they say that present education system actually not helpful for entrepreneur. This is one opinion. On the other hand, you are also a researcher. I know that um, many industry, even they say that many of research is not helpful for uh, uh, industry. What's your opinion actually in present situation that entrepreneurs, uh, they do not have a lot of uh, opportunity to learn from the present uh, academic system? Or what are the challenges? I, I think there should be more um, classes. Like if somebody's an engineer, it would be nice if they took a few business classes. I mean, those are the people that are most successful. So many heads of Silicon Valley have EE degrees, and then they got an MBA afterwards. And so it's, uh, I would like to see, I'd like to see more, but if you, look at things that don't have anything to do with business, like literature or um, sociology. Oftentimes, the people who do those as undergraduates keep learning, and then they wind up getting better at what they're doing when they get into different positions. Sociologists become it, can work inside of companies and, and know in human resources, things like that. They know a lot. So there's, it's sort of up to the person to get out of their own world and try to get into the different world. So you can go to meetups. If you're a engineer, go to marketing meetups, things like that. But I think everything you learn is valuable, but the, uh, I agree that the educa education system, I'm working with some kids that are that created an entrepreneurial track at UC, oh, sorry, at Cal State Chico. And they just did it on their own. Yes. Uh, beside that, sir, like uh, in this COVID-19 situation, many countries has problem. Even you, you are talking about Lebanon. Many countries has a lot of ch changes and a lot of challenges and they have to take a lot of different strategies then they never think that it will happen uh, but what will happen for the globalization the globalization will continue or yeah. i i kind of think it's inevitable i mean there there's a lot of work to try and stop it. you know i mean there's a lot of uh nativism nationalism and stuff like that right now where you know that's but if you look at the polls in the United States, 65% of people think that immigration is valuable. They don't want Trump's wall. They think it's stupid. And so I think that people get afraid, but I also think that at a government level, that government should really be trying to continue to encourage their people in their country to go to school in other countries, do business with people in other countries, do what they can to make the relationships and continue those relations. I'm a strong, strong believer in globalization. 
it maybe needed to be managed better, but it was very Yes. So uh, beside that, I, I just want to know your concluding remarks um, about the World Talent Economy Forums. Uh, we, we have our research center, Asia Research and Development Institute, and uh, in Malaysia, we have our, our organization, Al Noor Academy. Uh, so, so we what your advice, how we can grow properly, how we can make uh, perfect mentorships and uh, we get a proper advice and we can grow according to the global uh, guidelines. I, I, the department I was at at Stanford is called the Economic Sociology. And the, the idea of that is that if you take a purely economic view, what you're doing is you're, you're considering society to be an aggregate of individuals, each acting in their own self-interest. But that can't be true because, for instance, language and the meaning of everything around us, we didn't make that up. That came from us, other people. And if we weren't there, it would still be there. So there's a lot that's around us that we don't see that has to do with our institutions, it has to do with our um, language, culture, all, all these kinds of things. And if you're doing research, it's a really, really good idea to keep that in mind and not have a purely economic view. And then if you do that, it helps a lot for when you're te teaching and training people, because you can get the people to understand that the resources they need aren't in their head. The resources they need are out in the world and they have to go out in the world and get those resources. And then once people understand that, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to teach them anything because they they realize that all of the things and connections they're making are valuable. So, and don't be afraid. If you're not, make, if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning things. That's just the way it is. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's actually really valuable discussions. And for us, uh, you are you are really, really valuable. Even my personal life and many times you give very good guidelines and many very good advice, which is really helpful for me oh, even for, for growth. So so hopefully in the future, we arrange different kind of policy discussion, group discussions. Sure. And yeah, with, with different. Yes. And we will invite you most and hopefully with your valuable contribution we can make a meaningful uh, forum and definitely we can we will grow together and we can make a, a very very effective solution for different community thank you sir thank you perfect we need to drill down a bit so that'll be wonderful thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you. for your valuable time and everything it was fun thank you for the opportunity i love sharing this stuff so it's it's wonderful yes. for Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.